Hi, y'all. Let's talk about that so-called Muslim ban and Monday Night Massacre Peace Theater. Unless you've been living under a rock, you are by now, I'm sure, aware that the president has issued a number of executive orders, among which is one dealing with immigration from seven particular countries and visas and uh, refugees uh, and suspending those programs until various things can be done and that some people were detained at an airport and this led to a big uh, controversy. And, well, we lost an acting attorney general who apparently decided that she, unlike all of her predecessors, is unconstrained by the legal obligations of her office, and indeed in her little homily about why she was taking the decisions that she was taking, she decided to not really talk about the law so much, but a lot of philosophy. So, as she, as she noted in her little uh, missive, the Office of Legal Counsel has determined that the executive order comports with the Constitution and the statutes of the United States on its face, as it's written. There is no constitutional violation. There is no statutory violation. It's perfectly lawful, as written. Uh, but her obligations, she claims, as the acting attorney general, are broader than that of the Office of Legal Counsel, where she has to take into account positions that the administration has taken, uh, various actions, um, doing justice. Apparently, she's decided as an attorney to ignore Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' um, response to a, a woman or a citizen who had said something to him like, your job is to do justice. And he said, no, my job is to apply the law. Apparently, she missed that lesson in law school, school, so, you know, could happen to anybody. Maybe she called in a liberal that day. Who knows? But in any event, um, and that uh, she does not think this policy is unwise. Uh, she does not think this policy is wise. She doesn't think it's just, and therefore she's ordering Justice Department uh, officials not to defend it. And then she ends by saying that she's not persuaded that this uh, executive order is lawful which is a strange position to take for an attorney, since it is trivially easy to determine that it is, in fact, lawful. Uh, when the Constitution was drafted, they did a lot of reading on something called the Law of Nations, which uh, was a, tr uh, a political treatise written in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, so they read that because the founders wanted to make sure that when we were constructing our government, even though we were going to be doing things different from all the other people in certain ways, we wanted to be a, a good nation. We wanted to behave like a mature, responsible group of people and get along with everybody else uh, to the extent that we possibly can. So they read about this and how, how a good nation, a just nation that is still sovereign, would act in the world, and one of which deals with letting people in and who should be let in and under what circumstances and uh, the fact that it is a touchstone of sovereignty to be able to exclude anyone that you should like to exclude for any reason whatever. Now, one of the exceptions to that is uh, about how it's not just to exclude people on religious grounds, provided, and here's the caveat, provided that the people who come here um, from a different religion don't proselytize, that they, they you know, kind of just keep the peace, which is, of course, something that we couldn't impose upon people who are here in the United States because of that pesky First Amendment, uh, which allows for uh, free speech and freedom of religion and all these other things. Uh, so that doesn't quite work here. But nevertheless, we're still able to exclude them before they get here, even on religious grounds, or political grounds, or speech grounds, or racial grounds, or any other grounds that we should like to exclude them on, even though doing that to a citizen or a resident in the United States would be illegal. And the reason for it is quite simple. People who aren't citizens don't have any constitutional rights, and people who aren't in the United States don't have any constitutional rights, and therefore the hand of the Congress is free. It is a touchstone of sovereignty. It has plenary power to decide whom to permit and whom to exclude for whatever reasons it would like. And, uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago, there were four laws written, the Alien and Sedition Acts, one of which is called the Alien Enemies Act, which is now codified at 50 U.S.C. Section uh, 21. And I'll read an excerpt out of this because, as I mentioned, it doesn't take a uh, mental giant to figure out that the executive order is perfectly lawful as written in all respects. Black letter law and constitutional law. Oh, no, constitutional law point. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 grants Congress plenary power uh, to, to establish uniform rules for naturalization. To establish rules for naturalization implies that you're establishing rules by which people cannot be naturalized. In other words, you can decide who comes in, which means you're also deciding who has to stay the fuck out. But anyway, 50 U.S.C. 21, um, whenever there is a declared war between the United States and any foreign nation or government, or invasion or predatory incursion is perpetrated, attempted, or threatened against the territory of the United States by any foreign nation or government, this can become a meme in this video, isn't it? Or, um, and the president makes public proclamation of the event, like through an executive order, for example, just saying, 
all natives, citizens, denizens, or subjects of the hostile nation or government, being of the age of 14 years and upward who shall be within the United States and not actually be naturalized, shall be liable to be apprehended, restrained, secured, and removed as alien enemies. The president is the one who makes that determination. And, uh, you know, so that's one statute that deals, that, that is related to this. Another one is 8 U.S.C. section 1182, little f. Suspension of entry or imposition of restrictions by president. Whenever the president finds that the entry of, ali of any aliens or of any class of aliens into the United States would be detrimental to the interests of the United States, he may, by proclamation, like in an executive order, for example, just saying, uh, and for such, he, he may, by proclamation, and for such period as he shall deem necessary, suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants or impose on the entry of aliens any restrictions he may deem to be appropriate. So that's the black letter law from the Constitution, a couple of statutes written by Congress. It's not the exhaustive list of uh, law that we have on the subject, but they are relevant and, uh, you know, they, yep, the president has very expansive powers if he, may, if he makes a public proclamation about some kind of existential threat or the possibility of some ex existential threat or anything that touches on the interest of the United States that's threatened by uh, aliens. And uh, then after he does that, he has a very free hand in saying, mm -mm, you ain't coming over. Now, of course, sometimes uh, you may have heard about this. We have a legal system and statutes that occasionally get challenged for violating the Constitution uh, because, you know, government, is, though we are a government of laws, is nevertheless enforced, written, and whatnot, administrated uh, by men who do screw the pooch from time to time. So, these court cases arise. Here's one. Turner v. Williams, 194 U.S. 279, 1904. Congress has power to exclude aliens from and to prescribe the conditions on which they may enter. The United States, to establish regulations for deporting aliens who have illegally entered, and to commit the uh, enforcement of such conditions and regulations to executive officers. Deporting, pursuant to law, an alien who has illegally entered the United States does not deprive him of his liberty without due process of law. The Alien Immigration Act of March 1903, uh, 32, Statute uh, 1213, does not violate the federal constitution, nor are its provision as to the exclusion of aliens who are anarchists unconstitutional. So there you have the Congress of the United States writing a statute to exclude people because of their political speech in foreign lands and saying, we don't want you to bring that here. Now, once you get here, we can't stop you, but we can sure as hell stop you before you get here. Because why? We're a sovereign nation and we can exclude you on any grounds we want. Period. It does not offend the Constitution. If the Congress wanted to write a thoroughly unwise policy saying, uh, we don't like people from Africa, no Africans allowed, or no Mexicans allowed, or no Muslims allowed. They can do that. It's constitutional to do that. It is a touchstone of sovereignty. It would be terribly unwise. Uh, I would resist it um, at, the, at the ballot box, and I would uh, shout it down. But insofar as the law is concerned, it's a perfectly lawful order. And it is the duty of every public official to obey all lawful orders and to disobey all unlawful orders. Now, Ms. Kate, uh, Ms. Yates knows that it's the duty of people to disobey unlawful orders, so she's going to pretend, pretend that a, a very obviously lawful order is an ambiguously unlawful order, so that way she can get away from, uh, well, doing her actual duty that she swore to do. And indeed, there was this video clip of her being uh, interviewed by uh, Senator Sessions about the obligation of an attorney general or a deputy attorney general insofar as it comes to saying no to a president who has given an improper and unlawful uh, order. What is the responsibility of the Attorney General or Deputy Attorney General, or really anyone in the government? And it is to give the President uh, your independent advice and then refuse to obey the unlawful order. When the order is lawful and you have a crisis of conscience about how unjust it is, <coughs> your remedy to show how much you hate that law or that order is to resign and then uh, excoriate the official who issued the order. But that's not what she did. She decided to... Uh, this is a very common feature, particularly among the left, although the right does it when they're in power, too, so I don't want to be too uh, particular about it. But it's to pretend that their every emotion is constitutional law, in some sense. Therefore, 
uh, whatever they feel is really what the Constitution does say, whether it says it or not, or what the law says, whether it says it or not. Um, due process, equal protection of the laws, these are just labels to be, to be uh, you slapped on to whatever you think uh, you like the best. If, if you don't win, obviously it's a, it's a denial of due process, obviously it's a denial of equal protection of the laws, um, and anything that you want to be the law, you have to claim that the failure to get it is a violation of at least one of those two, oftentimes very many other things. So this is not, this is not presage the fall of the republic. You had a corrupt government official who, by the way, should be disbarred. She knowingly chose not, uh, not to do her duty as an attorney to her client, to zealously represent her client's interest. She did not do her duty as a public servant to in, uh, enforce and defend, as a you know, Department of Justice employee, all valid orders, all valid laws, all valid actions of the federal government or its employees. Now on to the issue that's uh, being conflated, and that is the difference, the distinction between what the executive order actually says and what government officials actually did on the ground. I would think that if I were acting attorney general and I saw that an executive order written as the one that Trump has put out says what it says, uh, and that there were uh, officials of the executive department who did what they did, that there was a disconnect and someone somewhere has to pay for it because someone somewhere is not following the executive order. The progressives, the leftists, the whatever the hell you want to call these nut jobs, are essentially uh, acting, if you want to think about it in terms of a customer, they've walked into a store. McDonald's or something, they've ordered a number three. The cashier is incompetent and gets them a number six. So they cook that up and they bring out the number six and they give the number six to the uh, the customer who opens it and notices, oh my god, this is a number six, not a number three, but instead of uh, saying, hey, you gave me the wrong thing, fix this, they say, oh my god, the menu is evil. The menu needs to be repealed. Whoever manages this restaurant wrote that menu is an evil person. They are blaming the menu for the incompetence of the employee. So too with DHS. The executive order nowhere mentions uh, resident aliens. It doesn't mention green cards. It doesn't mention citizens. Well, it does mention citizens in terms of protecting us, but in terms of its application to people who will be held, you know, no, you're not coming here, those people. Nothing to do with green card holders, you know, legal permanent residents, nothing to do with citizens. It's visa holders only. Visas are not legal. Per visa holders are not legal permanent residents. They're here part time, uh, and refugee applicants, people who it has always been thought it's perfectly uh, possible for the president and the Congress to decide to exclude entirely. Now, some green card holders apparently were detained. One of whom was released before they even got into court. But whatever, and uh, so they take it to court. Now, due process. Once you're here and you're being deported. Due process means you get a hearing. You get to be carted in to a court. It is your privilege to go to the court and to present to the court evidence that, for example, you're actually a citizen or you're actually a green card holder or whatever it is that you are which would make this order not apply to you. Now, how do you do that? You read the text of, of the order or the law, whatever it happens to be, federal regulation, whatever it is, and then you compare what's written on the page against your circumstances. And if there's a disconnect, you win. If there isn't, well, Maybe equitable reasons will let you off, maybe not. Who knows? That's what the judges are there to do. In this case, walk in. I am a green card holder. I'm a legal permanent resident, or I'm a citizen. Nothing in the executive order says anything about detaining me. These DHS agents are exceeding their authority. They are acting ultra-virus. They are acting in contravention of the law. Release me. And the judge would go, very good. You are released. Or they're enjoined from detaining you, or whatever it happens to be. But, uh, you know, so because someone somewhere screwed the pooch and decided to do something that was not authorized by the executive order, and therefore not by statute, because there was no public proclamation by the president in respect of that issue, uh, they were acting in excess of their authority. If I were acting attorney general, I would have an investigation. I might even convene a grand jury to, find, to investigate whether or not these agents are infringing upon the rights of citizens and, and legal permanent residents, in contravention of law. You know, that's what you do in a country like ours with a good legal system, a decent legal system. When people violate the law, we have ways of investigating and redressing that. Since the acting attorney general decided that she doesn't want to be any part of actually stopping 
DHS agents on the ground from doing more than they're authorized to do uh, because she wanted to get herself fired, she's no longer there to, to stop that. All she can do is complain and pretend that the order is what is dubiously lawful rather than saying the order is lawful. It's very obviously lawful. The Supreme Court of the United States has ruled that it is lawful to exclude these people for any reason whatever, even if it's a bad reason. It is plainly obviously lawful. Therefore, uh, whatever the problem is, it's not in the executive order. It must be with employees somewhere in the department. Let me go see if I can unfuck them. Now, I'm told that there was chaos because some people were confused. I've read the order. It's not very confusing. It's very plainly written. Uh, and, you know, they said, well, Steve Bannon told whoever. People in the government should realize, this, this might be a good rule that President Trump should lay down, or, I don't know, lawyers in the Department of Justice under a different acting attorney general than a different attorney general who will give advice to other departments in the executive branch, might want to advise people about the pecking order and who follows whose orders. The secretaries of the departments do not follow the orders of special counselors to the president. They follow the, pres the orders of the president and the laws enacted by the Congress. So if Steve Bannon is the one who picked up the phone and, and he's the one who got this ball rolling, then the, uh, the problem there is, one, for him not knowing his place, and two, on the department, you know, DHS, for not knowing the command structure, which does not include special advisors or counselors to the president. They take orders from a finite set of people, none of which are special counselors to the president. It's the president himself. And how do, you, how do these orders come about? Well, in this case, it's a written order. So what they should have said is, well, I've read the order. It doesn't mention legal uh, permanent residence. It doesn't mention green cards. It doesn't mention anything like that. Go fuck yourself. And if the president wants to fire me, uh, well, wouldn't that be dandy? That would actually be a, a kind of awesome to get one guy fired for actually obeying the executive order and then one gal fired for disobeying it in the same week. Now, that would have been a good news cycle. So the, uh, the story that uh, the media should be going after, because it's a good story and it's one that should be investigated, is why is it that senior officials in government and, and executive agencies of the United States government don't seem to know from whom they take their orders? Rather than all the race baiting and the pretend that this is a Muslim ban, there are 40, I don't know how many, 40-some-odd uh, Muslim countries, of which seven are on a list, and these happen to be ones where there's a high degree of terrorism going on at the moment, where we know there is a group there called ISIS that wants to come kill us. And on some objections, by the way, just as my closing out here about uh, banning the Muslims and how that is going to swell the ranks of ISIS. Now, these nitwits are the ones who will tell me ISIS, I'm sorry, uh, Islam is a religion of peace. Apparently, it is a religion that peaches peace so uh, ardently that if they don't get their way, the only other option that they can choose is to join terrorists and start committing murders and rapes genocides and religious persecution. Now, I would think that if that's your next option, that n number one would be coming here, number two would be, or be a terrorist. I don't want you here, quite frankly, if that's, I would put being a terrorist number three on my list. Number one would be like, getting the hell out of here. Okay, I understand that. Number two would be like, killing the terrorists in my own land so we don't have them anymore. And number three is, as a fallback, if I can't do either of those, oh, fine, if you can't beat them, join them. But I'll at least try to beat them first. <laughs> but no, and these people seem to think that if, uh, if not led in the United States, all these very peaceful people will immediately resort to murder. Because after all, if you don't get your way on everything that you want, the next best option is to start murdering people. Who knew? Now, the reason they say this is because they don't understand the implication of their arguments. I think they don't think about it. Or they, uh, they are in favor of the goals of ISIS. Or they don't really believe their malarkey about Islam being a religion of peace. I'm willing to say it's little of column A, little of column B. All right, have a great day.